Hello and welcome to Talk from Superheroes. Hey everybody, I'm Andrew Ivamy. And I'm Diana McCullum. And you're listening to Talk from Superheroes, where every week we discuss a piece of superhero television or film. And this week on the podcast, we are talking about Venom, Let There Be Carnage. That's that's it. Venom 2. Ven- We're going to call it Venom 2, Venom probably. 2. We're talking about Venom it's 2. It's the second Venom. It's, it's, it's v- Venom again. Yeah, it's Ventunum. Ven, it's 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 more venom. It's venom again. It's too venom, too venom. Too venom, too symbiotic. Ooh, uh, that kind of works. I, yeah, all right. Yeah, you know what? You know what? Yeah. Is there anything with the word "by" meaning "to" and "symbiote"? Like, hmm, mm. too much. Yeah, it's not obvious. But I think that might be too, too clever by an inch. You mm. know what I mean? But I see what you're saying. Like yeah. venom, symbiotic. Yeah. But then people would be like, is is he bisexual? And I mean, the answer is maybe. I, probably. Probably. Uh, it seems. It would seem. There's indications. It's not explicit, but not explicit. We'll, you know, it's there's there's implied tones. Uh but I see what you're saying. Bi can also mean two. So Venom Venom two. Venom 2. Venom 2 is what we're talking about today. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Venom 2 since it is a, uh, a new film. Uh, whenever we talk about something new, we give you a spoiler-free review. So real quick, we're going to give you a spoiler-free review in case you're on the fence about seeing it, if you're uncertain, or if you just want a taste of this episode before you then go see it and then listen to the rest of the episode. A little bit of Venom before a you little, Venom. Mm, just a <laughs> little bit of finger-licking Venom. Uh, so we're going to give you a spoiler-free review, and then once you hear the theme song after that we're going to get into the spoiler filled section so spoiler warning once you get over to that side of the podcast uh but let's start with the spoiler free review uh diana did you like it it was fine it was uh it was it was venom 2 was the sequel to venom 1 and it it was in many regards that uh it kind of felt like like schrodinger's venom to me it's like it's like it could be anything it's like boring but it's also fun it's like, I want these characters to be fleshed out, but I also like that it's only 90 minutes, so maybe don't. It's it's whatever you want to be. I I don't even know how to describe this movie. It's like when you go to a modern art exhibit and there's one that's just a mirror on the wall and they're like, this Ooh. art is you. And you're like, oh, I love it. Or yeah. if you don't like yourself, you're like, ew, yeah. awful art. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I really do feel like this is one of the few movies where I'm like, everyone's opinion is always valid, but like I get loving it and I get hating it. Some Equally. some opinions are more valid than others. Let's be real here. <laughs> let's be real. Let's let's be real. In here. terms of, I mean, ours are the most valid. It's our yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah, let's be real. So here. I'm gonna give it like I won't watch it again. I had enough fun. I was bored half of the time, and the other half of the time I was like, yeah, sure, cool. Uh, didn't have like a lot of stakes or anything, but there was a couple laughs. Everyone's having fun. It's 90 minutes. Uh, so yeah, it's fine. Andrew, did you like it? Yeah, I liked it. I think it's fun. Oh, you gave it a like. I gave it a like. It's fun. I, I think that I, I I think that it is fun. I think that it's unpretentious. I think it knows exactly what it is. Uh, I think after after we saw the first movie, so the first Venom movie, people it was surprisingly positive. Like people surprisingly liked it. And I remember at the time saying that there, and I can't remember if I said this on the podcast or if it was just in our personal life. I remember saying there is no way that Venom 2 will be a good movie because there is no way Sony knows why anyone likes Venom 1. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way that Sony is like going to lean into the fact that they're like, wow, Venom became like a weird Babadook level gay icon that we don't understand. Like, I'm like, there's no way Sony's going to understand why people like this and there's no way they're going to make it again. And they made it again. This is exactly Venom 1. If you liked Venom 1, you will like this movie. It is a throwback to superhero action movies of the late 90s, early 2000s. It's a tight 90 minutes of whatever. It is the good kind of bad. Is it art? No. Is it the uh, well-made film? Pro- no. No, it's not. Is it fun, unpretentious and self-aware? Absolutely. Yes. So it is the good kind of bad in every possible regard and a, a style of movie that does not get made right now, which for all warts and all is kind of fun to see and kitschy to a certain degree. I get what you're saying. I will agree that like the parts that are bad are not like bad. 
You're not mm. like, ooh, they didn't know how to make a movie. You're like, oh, this is bad. Yeah. <laughs> but like on purpose bad. Yeah, it's not a joke, but you find yourself going, <laughs> okay, whatever. Like you find yourself just kind of chuckling along. And I'm not mad at that. I think I would just rather like the parts that are comedic and supposed to be funny, I didn't felt landed hardly ever. Like mm. I didn't find Woody Harrelson ever got a laugh out of me. Right. Um, I didn't find much of the Tom Hardy Venom discussions very funny or anything. Like, okay. There's a few parts that I was like, oh, that's funny. Or like the really over the top parts were over the top. But I think I needed more of that. Like I needed it to push it a little bit more and still say like stay trashy and Venomy. Like yeah. Venom is trashy, which I do like. There's yeah. not really a superhero who's like that. Yeah. <laughs> he just feels like he hasn't showered in a month at all times. Mm -hmm. And I do like that. It's he's which I think he why he resonates with people. We've right. all been there. He's a little trashy. He's a little trashy. Yeah. But yeah, so I think I'd like a little bit more humor and like stakes in the fun, but like I get why it's fun. Yeah, I, I think it is. I agree with you. It could have it could have been more humorous. It is a little bit self-aware and kind of leans into it, I think, a bit more than the first one, but it doesn't quite go all the way there. It doesn't quite go where, say, uh, Evil Dead uh, to Evil Dead mm. 2, like that, like the first one, people being like, is this camp? And then the second one being like, yes, we are indeed camp. It doesn't quite get that full angle on camp, but I don't quite know if it wants to be that. But either I had a breezy and fun time, I'll say. That's fair. Yeah, a few times I felt like it wanted to be like a Sam Raimi Spider-Man tone and wasn't yeah. quite getting there. Yeah. But I was like, I see what you're trying to do, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was walking up close to being the dark side of a Sam Raimi Spider-Man. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, I can, I can agree with that. All right, and so can I'm fine, it, and you're like, and can it be spoiled? Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, going blind, folks. Yeah, go in blind, uh, as 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 blind as you can. Uh, there'll be like, you know, uh, a couple things we'll discuss in the spoiler filled section that I think are are pretty big moments of joy. If you are able to go in, to go in blind. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I would definitely recommend it if you're a superhero fan. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's our spoiler free review of uh, of Venom Two. Before we get Venom. into Bef uh, bef minimum. Before we get into the spoiler-filled section of the podcast, we want to thank our first sponsor of today's episode. Uh, it is our friends over at NordVPN. Oh, NordVPN. You're keeping all my information safe, my mm -hmm. computer safe. I love that. Nord they're getting VPN. me the entertainment that I like, so I like that as well. Tons of things they're doing. They are the cyber Swiss army knife that you need on your computer. Who doesn't like Swiss army knife? Multiple functions is the idea. That's yes, the because, because depending on what you need, one of the functions is going to be security. It's going to mask where it is that the information you send out to the internet is coming from, adding an additional level of security for you. And then the great thing about that is that it's going to be able to add that to pretty much all of your devices. Like I've got the app on my phone. I've got it on the iPad, the laptop. Uh, I've got it on the uh, on my iMac, my like home desktop computer as well. So like I'm set up across the board. And the great thing about me having it set up across the board is that the app on all of these different devices that I have, which are different operating systems, platforms, sizes, it's all easy to use everywhere. The NordVPN app is just literally, I open it, I hit a button. You don't need to be tech savvy. You don't need to know how they do the wizardry they do, but they do it. You, I do not know what VPNs are in a technological sense, and they're so easy to use. It seems intimidating. It really is. You download it. You open it. You hit protect me. You hit what country you want to be from. It is right there in the first menu. It's so easy. You can, your one login works on six devices. Mm -hmm. Your privacy and your data is absolutely safe. NordVPN is the fa NordVPN is the fastest VPN in the world, so it's not going to slow down your stuff. You're going to have a great time on the internet. And there are other advantages too because the the way a VPN works is that it's disguising your location. It's disguising where it is that your information is coming from, which as we were mentioning is great for security, but because it changes the location that your, uh, that your internet is going to be coming from, it also allows you to access content online that maybe you're not able to access in the region that you are in. Sometimes very silly things will be region locked to us because we're in Canada and the internet just hates us. I don't know why, but the internet has just decided Canada is, we just don't get the full experience. Really basic things. Like, you can't watch this clip from a talk show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, come on. Uh, come on. A tweet. I've been lo regionally locked out of tweets, and I'm like, really, internet? 
tweets you're going to be blocking me out of. And then you're like, not today, though. Not today, though. I pop open NordVPN. I press a button. And then I'm able to get access to the thing that I've become insanely curious about because I've been told that I'm not allowed to see it. And that just makes the curiosity bigger. And how then dare I'm like, you hide this how, da- how dare you? Uh, so NordVPN, fantastic service for both uh, security and accessing uh, online content. And we have a, a special offer. Go to nordvpn.com slash TFS and use promo code TFS to get 73% off your two-year plan plus four bonus months for free. Uh, Be quick because this offer is for a limited time only. So once again, nordvpn.com slash TFS, promo code TFS, 73% off a two-year plan, four bonus months. Be quick about it. And thank you, NordVPN, for your support. Thank you so much, Nord. And now let's get into the episode. Let's talk about Venom Venom. 2. We have seen Venom 2. We are now in the spoiler filled section. Uh, we were dan- Venom's in this. We were dancing around it in the beginning. We're not going to fully unpack it just yet in the episode. But maybe you're hopping in because you've seen the movie. Maybe you're someone who doesn't care about spoilers. But the big spoiler is the post credit sequence. We'll talk about it later in the episode. Other than that, I think this movie is relatively spoiler-free, just kind of like a straightforward 90s popcorn movie. Oh, yeah. You got this movie pegged from the opening backstories. Yeah. I mean, oh, there's Venom and there's Carnage. and Are they going to fight? They did. You got this pegged from the trailers, you know? <laughs> from like the trailers. It's, no surprise. It's pretty I mean, smooth. But I just wanted to lay that out there, the way we had to dance around it in the beginning. The only spoiler is the post credit, which we'll talk about later. Yeah. Yeah, so the re- the regular movie is a regular movie. Yeah. The the main chunko mm-hmm. of movie. <laughs> chunko. Oh, it's a chunko. It's, it's a chunko. Actually, I shouldn't call it a chunko because it's only 90 minutes. It it's is. It's just way for thin. It is a way it's for a, thin movie. It's a thin movie about two thick boys. <laughs> two, uh, two thick gooey boys. The movie starts in, uh, we get this flashback sequence, 1996 at Ravencroft Mental Facility. These backstories are breezed through. I gotta mm. say, I loved that. But yeah, what were you, or sorry, were you going somewhere with, oh. Yeah, um, that was Woody Harrelson o- voicing over that young actor, right? Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, yes, that was, absolutely. That was cool. I actually did, I actually liked this. Mm. Not gonna lie. I'm on the fence about it. I liked it, but it did also feel like a very wild artistic choice just for the sake of an artistic choice that didn't really need to be done. But it was fun-ish. The thing that I find funniest about it is that this flashback, it's the year 1996. Okay. And they've got a different actor playing young Woody Harrelson uh, to be like, this is the young guy. This is what Woody Harrelson looked like in 1996 when he was doing murders. 1996, I'm pretty sure it was when Natural Born Killers came out. In 1996, Woody Harrelson just looked like Woody Harrelson doing murders. He He, has not, he's kind of Paul Rudd esque. He he, has not aged all that much. Yeah, he's Paul Rudd esque in the sense that he's always looked 55, Mm. but like that is kind of his. Will Ferrell esque. Yeah, maybe Ferrell esque. (laughs) He's always looked like an adult man. Yeah, yeah. but we don't need to use the de aging tech on everything. I'm fine with using a younger actor, uh, but the. It, it felt very much like when we went to see Fast and Furious and we looked it up and like in the recent Fast and Furious, they have a flashback and the guy playing young Dom is older than Vin Diesel was when Vin Diesel filmed the first Fast and Furious. So you could just use footage from Fast and like, Furious so it's and just, that's what Dom looks like. It's this wild, <laughs> sur- it felt very much like that where I'm like, I know what 96 Woody Harrelson mm. doing a murder looked like and it was not you, sir. I get what you're saying about how it's seeming very artistic and then not that this movie, and this movie's not artistic, but like it opens <laughs> up and it like pretends it is with these artistic choices. And here's why I think they did it. I don't think they did it to be artistic. I think they were just like, this movie moves so fast. We need to make sure you know who everyone is like lined up. So uh, Shriek, Naomi, Naomi Harris's character, mm. gets the ring. 
gets the, the right. little cloth ring. It's like, so you're going to know who this character is through the whole movie. But how will people know this is Woody Harrelson? But young, we don't have an identifying feature. He'll have to have Woody Harrelson's voice. It's the only way they'll figure out that that's him. <laughs> we didn't give him like a tattoo or, or just say the character name. <laughs> So I really sincerely think that's why his voice comes out of that actor. I can see that. I can absolutely see that. Now, what what is wild to me is that I warmed up to Woody Harrelson during this movie as Cletus Cassidy as Carnage, uh, a character who like I'm familiar with from the comics. I I, I like the symbiotes. I I like uh, I, I I enjoy the symbiote saga of Spider Man in the comic books. But this young actor who plays like young Cletus Cassidy, young Woody Harrelson. Mm-hmm. It is weird because he is exactly what I picture Cletus Cassidy to be. Oh, to the shit. point where I saw him recently in uh, Gunpowder Milkshake, the this one with Karen Gillian, one? this okay. actor, the young okay. one, in Gunpowder Milkshake. And I actually thought, I'm like, this dude would be a fucking good carnage. So it's kind of wild he got to play it for a minute as a younger one, but this dude is dead on, a, like a dead ringer for what I picture for comic book Cletus Cassidy wow. Carnage. Wow, Andrew, did you cast this movie? Are you friends with the casting? I would have so? loved it to have been this dude. I don't know. It's It being a older Woody Harrelson is a wild choice. Uh, I warmed up to it, but it's not who I really envision knowing this character. I was... I was iffy on Woody. I like I like Woody overall, but like I don't feel like he did enough with such a crazy mm. character, like a character who is just off the rails, unhinged. Every now and then, I really liked him. I think my favorite scene was probably the scene where he bit Eddie and tasted blood, and he's just like, "I know what blood tastes like," and I'm like, "That's haunting." Yeah, that is. This scene is my favorite Woody Harrelson scene, and the rest of the time he's just kind of like slightly hamming it up, and not in a way that I'm like, I didn't get far enough for me. I do think that there are like, like you pictured that guy, but when I picture Venom, I picture um, not to be like you should only play villains. Um, the guy who played the Joker in Gotham. I like, al- I also ah, could see that he as would have well. been amazing. Yeah, there's not that many like young chaotic redheads out there. It, he's he's got that pool, energy. Yeah, but he's very good. It's yeah. not just because he's a redhead. Even if wasn't a redhead I'd be mm. like dye his hair right <laughs> right I think he could do it so yeah I liked Woody sometimes I thought he didn't do enough the rest of the time yeah I think he is playing it as you know it is a serial killer and I think he's playing it as kind of a hammy Hannibal Lecter mm-hmm. which is a choice but I I do think Carnage is more chaotic he's not the like this reserved, careful, I have a plan, I have to get the word out there, write my memoirs, Eddie. That's not the like the chaotic dude who murders on a whim and eats people. Like that is that is a type of serial killer, <laughs> but it doesn't really work for this archetype, for this character. And like Woody Woody Harrelson is like a finely in shape middle-aged man, but I'm like, if it was Woody Harrelson and Tom Hardy ever got in a fight? I'm like, Tom Hardy would rip you from limb to limb. Like, I'm not afraid of his chaotic energy. And it's not just that he's in a cage. I'm just like, if Eddie Brock walked into that cage with you, I am in no way afraid of Cletus Cassidy if no one has a symbiote here. Yeah, symbiotes aside, Tom yeah. Hardy's got this. Yeah. Absolutely no problem. Yeah, he's, he's, he's more crazy once he gets carnage. But as he's already a serial killer, you'd think he would already be... Like just broken, yeah. broken kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. They, which they don't show, and I agree. That's like the fun of Carnage because Venom's already pretty crazy. So you yeah. really have to notch Carnage up to be like this guy's worse. Yes, because Venom's running around being like, I want to eat people. I'm the hero of the movie. And Cletus Cassidy's <laughs> default is, I want to eat people. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> once he gets a sy- symbiote, he should be like, I want to eat. I don't know. I'll eat legs. the moon. Like I'll he doesn't eat, care. I'll eat the building you're in. I'll yeah. eat your car. I'll eat your family. I will run. I'll eat bodies in a graveyard and go through your whole ancestral line. I'm Cletus Cassidy. So yeah, there's he doesn't he doesn't find like the next level. Yeah. But the movie kind of pretends he does. Like another one, another like scene that I actually think is really good that I laughed really hard is when Venom sees Carnage for the first time and he's like, oh no 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 no. No idea. <laughs> Eddie, must to, go, Eddie. He wants to bounce. <laughs> it's so funny. And then Eddie and Shriek are, or, or Carnage and Shriek are just like, you, are you coming? Are we doing this? Are we having this fight? It's a really great scene. That That's probably my, and again, actually I am, 
I'm warming up to Venom as I talk to him about him because I'm like, that is so relatable. Just being like, I can't win this fight. No. Let's go. He's the big, he's the big powerful one, Eddie. Oh, he's red. Eddie. Reds are crazy. Gotta be red. <laughs> I can eat people. I don't know why like... I'm doing a mildly Irish accent sometimes. When I'm... I mean, because like, sometimes like... that pops out of Tom Hardy. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, will yeah. say one of my notes in this movie is that Tom Hardy and Michelle Williams have wildly varying accents throughout the film. Ooh, I didn't notice it with Michelle. I well, kind of noticed it with Tom. I noticed it with Tom. I, I don't know if I noticed it with Michelle, but I'm almost positive. I know I should have watched a clip before we started. Wasn't she like hard Boston in the first movie? I don't recall that. I recall her. And then she's just like straight American now. Oh, okay. She wasn't hard Boston. Huh. I remember her being hard Boston in the I first one, but I, I won't I can I neither won't confirm or deny. I because can... I can't believe I forgot to watch a clip to make sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but Tom Hardy's was breaking. Right, but I love Tom Hardy's performance of this. Tom okay. Hardy is doing everything. He is having the best time, and I fucking adore it. I absolutely adore it. It's a pretty good time. There was no, like, level of, in the first one, when he got into the lobster tank, which is the scene everyone talks about. Mm. Like, that wasn't in the script. Right. Tom just jumped into the lobster tank. Oh. Ah. <laughs> and everyone's like, oh, we're going with this. Okay. Mm. Um, so there was nothing that level in this one, but he is just, like, throwing himself around the apartment, covering himself in food. Yeah. During crazy scenes. Yeah, he's, he's, he, I love that. I think there's very few actors who would be like, I'm a superhero in a superhero franchise and I am garbage. And I am I'm, just, a, I'm the trash man. I'm, I am, here I am. I live in trash. I'm sweaty all the time. I'm unhappy. I don't look good, even though I'm a very handsome man. Yeah. Like, except for like the scene where he shows up in the really nice leather jacket to see Anne and she finds out she's married. I'm like, sure. you look like a handsome man. Yeah. And then the rest of the movie, he's a garbage monster. Like, even, even when him and Venom separate and he cleans up his apartment, it is still a middling to poorly living man's apartment. Like, it is not... If I went over, and regardless of the damage Venom had done, imagine, <laughs> like, there are no holes in the ceiling, all that's fixed, imagine it's all fixed. I still go over to Eddie's apartment as it is, and I'm like, dude, you've just got, like, a can of soda, a box of cereal, a weird TV in the corner on its own with a love seat in front of it, like, no seating for friends. Mm. Just, like, this is a sad man's apartment you have. Yeah, and that's the apartment he had before he got venomed. Yeah. So this is this is OG Eddie. This is this just is his Eddie. life. This is why him and Venom work together. And I love <laughs> and respect that. That that A Tom Hardy is like I'm the garbage man. Mm -hmm. I'm play the garbage man living a garbage life in the in this fun unpretentious garbage movie. And I think that there is a fun and a charm to that because I was thinking that once Venom left him in this movie, I'm like, oh, now we're going to see him like he's going to get a promotion. He's going to be on top of the world. Things are great. And he's like, no, things are just aggressively mediocre for he's, me. I can now watch a football game. And well, that's things it. Gr got aggressively worse because a serial killer was after him and he didn't have a symbiote anymore. <laughs> That is true. So he was like, oh, no, 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 no. Fuck, fuck, back fuck, 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 sweaty, fuck, 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 Back to stressed. Yeah, he, that, that man doesn't get a, a minute's rest. No, he really does. I I think, too, the, the section where they separate, the other thing that I really like about Tom Hardy's performance in this that is kind of easy to forget is that as much as he's doing everything as Eddie Brock and very much like I'm in an apartment alone, throwing myself around, covered in food, I'm making an ass out of myself, but he is like vaudeville like commedia dell'arte like level of like i'm dedicated to just doing whatever it is necessary for this character but he's also a great voice actor for venom like the section where venom's alone I'm like you get this cgi character as well as like a bradley cooper doing groot or a, Vin or a bradley cooper doing rocket a vin diesel doing groot like you it if you weren't the live action Eddie Brock, you also would be good casting to be just the voice of Venom if a different actor played Eddie Brock than voiced Venom. It is wildly impressive. I remember when we saw the first movie and I was going crazy because I'm like, they didn't credit the voice of Venom. Who's doing Venom? And yeah. I didn't I didn't believe it was Tom Hardy because it is such a wildly different sound to his voice, but it doesn't even but it also doesn't sound like Bane. 
which you would think would be like his default mm-hmm. other voice. Not that you can only do one voice, but yeah. like he's not known as a voice actor. He is known as like a very good actor. But to do this like incredibly different nuanced performance with a voice that sounds entirely different to yours when you are not like normally a voice actor is really impressive. Um, I assume also because I, I, I doubt he was switching on the spot because Venom's like in the scene with him. So I mm-hmm. guess he wasn't talking to himself in scenes, but it's still, it's still a very fleshed out character that you're like talking to yourself with. It's very impressive. Yeah. And, and I think adding to the performance of that, the fact that he's, you know, not switching live, but the fact that he's doing these scenes with nothing and he's physically dedicating and really nailing it. And it's not overly edited as well. So he is doing this with razor sharp timing for what are, will later be his VO roles. Mm. Uh, so like to do it with razor sharp timing, because none of it is like a long one take, but it's not all cutaway either. So it is Eddie Brock delivering lines of like, I need to research Ravencroft. And on set, it's him being like, I need to research Ravencroft. Dead silence. Yeah, but you don't know what you're talking about, though. Dead silence. Or or someone feeding him the lines. But either way, him matching it up, he's doing a phenomenal job from live to voice. And even with the voice stuff, the other thing that I can kind of feel is that when it's not matching up pacing-wise or he changed something day of, he has added these vocal ticks to Venom, which make Venom feel way more fleshed out and fill the time in between beats so it does feel like two friends talking over one another as opposed to, like, an overly rehearsed who's on first Mm -hmm. sketch. So, like, he's added this, like... he is Eddie says a line and then maybe the Venom line doesn't fill enough time. So Venom will do this like, Eddie, 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 I'd, I'd really like, I'd really like to have some cereal now, Eddie. Like he's adding these little timing ticks to fill and stretch it out and make it more conversational and fast paced, even though it's slow. It's a wildly good performance. It is very good. And it feels like an actual argument, which is very hard when you're, cause like a lot of, and I will give credit to the, to the director and editor. Cause a lot of these times in these kind of movies, they do not like voices to overlap, but Eddie and Venom got to overlap a few times and the arguments feel heated and they do feel like they're like rising in intensity. And it isn't just like, like, uh, beats that he has to like go through. So yeah, it feels it feels real. There is, uh, I think my, another scene I really like is when he's meeting Anne and it's kind of one of the only times he's pretending Venom isn't there. So there's long shots of, of Eddie where he's not talking, but we can hear Venom. And it just reminded me of Scrubs when there would just be long shots of JD while right. he's like, doing his narration. And I'm like, people are talking to him. Why yeah. isn't he responding? <laughs> Which they bring up, and I think they make a joke about it in later seasons. Like, there's a season of Scrubs where they're like, oh, JD's going to do that thing now where we say something to him, then he's going to look into the middle distance and be really quiet for several minutes. For several minutes, yeah. yeah. That was the impression I got. But, like, it absolutely works because we can hear Venom and we know he's talking. Yeah. I'd love, like, I would love a scene from, like, Michelle Williams' perspective where she can't hear Venom and it's just Eddie <laughs> just for, like, two minutes not talking. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, his shoulders are moving or something, and he's mad. And and there was a lot of good comedy and good comedy delivery from Tom Hardy in this of him trying to sell, and really good, and surprisingly good writing, too, of him trying to sell lines that he is delivering to Venom to the rest of the world. Mm. You know, like I forget exactly some of them, but he has ones where, like, he's saying it to Venom, but then has to convince someone he's saying it to them, except for when he walks into the room. And they play off of that after they set up that habit, that pattern, to be, like, him being like, you idiot! And then I'm like, I don't have a reason to have said that to you just uh, now. I'm I know sorry. the exact one that was the best one. It was when he's at the prison, and he walks in, and he goes, you suck! And a lady guard is like what he's like i don't know why i said that i think i'm having a panic attack yeah because <laughs> yeah. he's also about to go about watch to an meet execution. a serial killer yeah yeah and watch an execution so you would have a panic attack so like just his recovery on that one of like the most basic answer of mm-hmm. i'm having a panic attack i'm having a panic attack yeah <laughs> i'm a very sweaty man i also uh will say i really like michelle williams in this role i know that i know that like you might say like her voice or you do say her voice accent is uh her accent is a little all over the place and not really sure but i think she does a good job of i'm an ex who still cares for you but no we don't have a chance this is for sure over but also i know venom is in there i've also had venom in me i know the plot of this movie 
You can, but it's okay. You go ahead and lie to me, but I do know the plot of what's happening. So I think she does like sell a couple different layers to her character that are not necessarily that complex, but she does a good job of walking that line of being very obvious to the audience and not necessarily obvious to Eddie. Uh, and 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 saying some things that are unspoken, you know. Yeah, she's doing a pretty good job. Like she's more memorable than other women have been in similar roles of like kind of throwaway superhero movies. Yes, yeah. Like she's more memorable than say like a Rachel McAdams and Doctor Strange. I was exactly about to use Rachel McAdams. I'm like, who and Doctor is the Strange most the... forgettable woman in a superhero movie of all time? Yeah. I'm like it's Rachel McAdams and Doctor Strange. Yeah, she's memorable. She's so forgettable in that role. Yeah, oddly. Not to put the burden of that on Rachel McAdams. It's a combination of the character, the writing, and, a, and several the, things the going on in that movie. Yeah, I think Rachel McAdams is a fine actress. Um, but yeah, she she does find the layers. I like her. I like her ability to care about Eddie and not put up with his bullshit. But also, like, not lead him on, as you said. You're not like, ooh, will it be Dr. Dan or will it be Eddie? You're like, it's going to be Dr. Dan because Eddie's with Venom. They're very happy together. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she she doesn't get much to do once she gets kidnapped. Mm-hmm. Um, she's kind of just done at that point. But, uh, but yeah, she, she has fun with that. I think the scene with Mrs. Chen's kind of weird paced out when Venom's in Mrs. Chen. I loved that scene. I liked I liked the reveal that he was in Mrs. Chen. I think Mrs. Chen was having a fun time, that actress, and I liked she, that half. She was owning that. Oh so no, much. she was. I didn't I didn't like this like come on out big boy and show me what you got thing oh, of Venom. Yeah, 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 yeah. That part yeah. I didn't care for. Yeah. This how she got Venom to help. Okay. But no, though him being in Mrs. Chen, genuinely, I think the only thing in this movie I didn't see coming. When they revealed it, I was like, oh shit, I actually did not think he was in Mrs. Chen. How did I miss this? And uh, like, and it makes kudos sense because she knows who Venom is. It yeah. totally fit. Uh, kudos to Peggy Liu, who's the, uh, the actor who plays Mrs. Chen. For just a brilliantly improv, or like a, a brilliant performance and of this scene. To be like, this this feels like a better melding of personalities than Eddie and Venom. Like, <laughs> like if Mrs. Chen had shown up to fight Carnage, I'd be okay with it. Right? <laughs> like the yeah. Mrs. Chen version of Venom. Like, I, I understand when you're Tom Hardy and you get cast as Venom, or you're anyone who gets cast as a mainline superhero, you probably start doing the research. You're reading the comics. You're checking out, like, old performances or animated TV shows. You're doing the legwork to be like, I want to understand who Venom is. Peggy Lou playing Mrs. Chen, the convenience store character, didn't have to do any of that for the first movie. Probably didn't have to do any of it for this. But it honestly feels like she walked on set and she was like, no, I know who Venom is. I've read every comic book. I get this character top to bottom. I am about to fucking nail this performance. Now, I don't know if she understood Venom, like the comic book character, but she understood Venom, the movie character. She's mm. like, I've been in a fight and I have refused to talk to my significant other before until there was an apology. Right. So I think she tapped into that aspect of what Venom was going through at the time yeah. perfectly. So I think that might be what she captured. I'm just being like, well, he should apologize to me. <laughs> to, to the point that she is, I think, in both movies, the only character other than Tom Hardy who voices Venom. Ooh, yeah, Michelle Williams doesn't voice Venom? I don't think she, because when she is Venom, you hear Tom Hardy's Venom's voice in her head. We hear mm. the internal dialogue. And either she transforms or she's Michelle Williams talking in her own normal voice or or mixed accents, depending on uh, how closely you're watching. This is the problem with theater movies that but I can't yeah, really I, watch. I can't think of anyone, because I think normally we get Tom Hardy's internal head voice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Although then, I like, think he's like doing the external, like maybe like half mixed until she changed her face. I can't remember now. She, she changes her face job. and then it's doing a mix. But she's she's doing his venom mm. and flawlessly. Yeah, it's it's a fun scene until Michelle Williams like has to like seduce Venom. Yeah, I, the Honey Pot's never a fun plot line. We're not we're not fans of the Honey Pot. No, I think that's a I think that's a given for us. Yeah, yeah. Um. Well, uh, let's take a break in today's uh, episode of the podcast to thank our second sponsor uh, of today's episode. It is Batman: The Audio Adventures. Bruce Wayne may appear to be a wealthy playboy, but beneath this facade, his true identity is that of the Batman, waging an endless war against crime. Join the Cape Crusader in Batman, The Audio Adventures, the first scripted audio original featuring Batman and his villainous rogues gallery in a world premiere story of life and death in Gotham City, debuting exclusively on HBO Max. 
starring Jeffrey Wright as Batman and a who's who of incredible Saturday Night Live alums. This rollicking adventure told across 10 episodes is written and directed by an Emmy winner Dennis McNicholas, includes devilishly delightful original music by Doug Bossy, and performances by Rosario Dawson, John Leguizamo, Chris Parnell, Melissa Villasenor, Seth Meyers, Jason Sudeikis, Brooke Shields, Fred Armisen, and many, many more. Go to hbomax.com slash Batman Audio Adventures for more and stream Batman The Audio Adventures only on HBO Max. Thank you, Batman The Audio Adventures, for supporting this episode of the podcast. Thank you, Batman. And now back to Venom 2. Venom. Venom. Um, Skibbity boop, Venom. I would like to talk about Detective Mulligan for a moment. Let's talk about Mulligan a little. If we may. Yeah. I have... I really like this actor, and I think he's doing a fun job. I have issues with maybe the casting overall, because okay. the main issue I have is that this man is quite short. Okay. Uh, the actor, uh, Stephen Graham. Okay. And there's like four scenes in a row where he's supposed to be like bullying Tom Hardy and like intimidating him, and Tom Hardy is like a foot and a half taller and like 150 pounds more than this guy. Yeah. And I just feel like the scene should be about how small he is if he's going to be this much smaller than Tom Hardy mm. because it really kind of takes away like that you're worried Tom Hardy's going to get in trouble with this cop when he's so much smaller than him. Right, right. So like that was kind of my... my so like just like looking at him, I'm like... Because Michelle Williams has a joke about how small he is. But right. Tom Hardy and Venom never have a joke about how small this guy is, hmm. which seems like a really odd missed opportunity. I think it's strange because Tom Hardy, I think, is playing Eddie Brock like Eddie Brock is meeker than he is, mm. than, than both Tom Hardy is, and weirdly than traditionally Eddie Brock is in the Eddie comics. Brock's like a bully. Yeah, he's yeah. kind of, a, he's a journalist, sure, but he's also like an ex-football player bully guy who in the comics, and I think even in the movie, part of the set dressing is like, you know, he's got weights and a bench press in his apartment. And I'm not saying everyone who, uh, you know, has weights and a bench press is like a bully or a brick shit house, but like he is the type of dude who writes an article and then like just starts bench pressing because he's got unresolved anger <laughs> issues. And they keep that set dressing and they keep that like look in casting Tom Hardy. But Tom Hardy plays him almost like, the Topher Grace Eddie Brock from Spider-Man 3, where it's like, I'm a small bean that no one really pays attention to. Yeah, so, like you said, like, he could beat up Woody Harrelson. Oh, yeah, he could beat up all of them. So, yeah. like, why are you scared of this guy? You know, he's a serial killer, but, yeah. like, you should be less meek than this for your size and for your character history. Yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, he is, uh, I never really noticed on camera how small he was in comparison to Tom oh, Hardy. Tom Hardy, like, Tom Hardy felt like he was venomed out compared to this guy. Like, mm. you know how Venom is, like, nine feet tall? It felt like he was full Venom compared to the size right. of this guy, and I was noticing it in every single shot. They weren't, they weren't helping this actor with the angles they were choosing. Like, Tom Hardy looked huge. Right, right, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think maybe I didn't notice it because it just reached a point where I reached Tom Hardy blindness, where I'm like, in order for any of this to function, I have to ignore the size, musculature, strength, and just day-to-day -day intimidation that Tom Hardy would bring walking into a room. That's fair. Yeah, so I have to just kind of like forget what he looks like in order to accept any of the other events of the film. All right. The, uh, the other thing about Det Detective Mulligan that I just thought was very funny was like, he keeps being really mean to Eddie. He's like, what did Cletus tell you? What are you, what are you hiding from us? What has Cletus been saying? And I'm like, all of these conversations, he's not a lawyer. You can just listen. <laughs> when mm. he goes in to talk to Cletus, right. that's not privileged information. Right. Put a camera in there. And also he's, he's a convicted serial killer. He's printing the information. Like he is willingly spreading the information far and wide. Eddie found out where the bodies were and told the police. Yeah. And then this guy's like, what else are you hiding, Eddie? And he's like, I told you where the goddamn bodies were. I'm literally giving you everything I here, am, bud. And it, and it helped my career. If I knew anything else, mm. I would tell you. Right. So his, his he's like just kind of a jerk through the whole movie and can't back it up with his size. So I'm like, what, what all are you, Detective Mulligan? Right. I did like him being uh, deafened by Shriek. That was actually like a plot twist where I'm like, oh, of course that makes sense. But I think because I was treating this as such a straightforward 
90s action movie, I did not expect a plot twist of any kind. I think that like if this was an MCU movie, I would have been like, hearing aids, a dude, we saw a flashback where a dude got hit, you're going to be that guy. Mm. I expected nothing from this movie, so it actually did kind of catch me off guard. Ah, I expected he'd come back just because in the flashback, they did a close-up of his name badge. And I'm like, oh, if you get a name badge oh, close up, right, or it'll right. be like your son or your dad or something right. um, later on. But I will say that is actually, um, I didn't like this movie as much as it sounds like I did <laughs> while we're talking about it. But a huge positive that I actually do have is for such a silly movie, they really found some really clean, believable motivations for all three villains to work together. Mm. Um, Shriek hated Mulligan because she he shot her in the eye. Yeah. Um, Carnage hated Eddie because he was on death row because of him. He yeah. wasn't going to get the electric chair before Eddie released where the bodies were. And then Carnage hates Venom because he's the only one who can defeat him and he will just rule the planet if Venom's dead. Like, it really did make sense that they worked together and that they went after the same group of people together. And I was like, for a movie with three villains, you really got this together like really cleanly and quickly for a 90 minute film. Like I feel like if you have three villains in say an MCU movie today, it'd be two hours and 45 minutes of trying to combine all their storylines right, and, right. and make it all work out. And I'm like, no, I believe all three of these motivations and how they connect and that you're working together and that you do hate the people you're going after. Mm. Yeah, it, it was oddly sensical. I, I agree with you. I think it I think it is a huge advantage and a smart starting point of the movie starting and obviously the the detective mulligan thing is meant to be a reveal. Maybe I now that you mentioned the name tag, she says the name earlier. Maybe I should have put it together, but I just got name blindness. Uh, a lot of blindness going around. But to start the movie and be like three of the three of the main characters know each other. Moving on. Like, that is quick. It is peppy. It's all you need. Whereas you're right, an MCU movie would, it would start with, like, where is Shriek? Shriek is alone and does not know anyone. Where is Carnage? Where is uh, Cletus Cassidy? All of these people have to come together. But this movie is just like, three of them are there. We just got to get them involved with Eddie. Their backstories then, are the then same. Then we're good. And then we separate. And then that cop will become a cop. And it all works out. Yeah, I think the only awkward thing for like how the story is structured is just how much time has passed. It mm. does. It feels like a, a normal amount to be like, I hate the cop who put me away, or who, in this case, who shot me in the eye. That's a very common thing. Uh, but to be like three different institutions ago, twenty years ago, I loved someone who I don't even know if they're alive. Uh, or out there or reading these messages to the newspapers and like if I like that wasn't a strong motivation for like I've got to get out I've got to see her and then just like I guess for 20 years one random psychologist would just like tease this woman every day about one boyfriend she had once and did not find any new material. You are not a helpful therapist, lady. No, you're, you're not just mean because I don't. You're even also feel like not even that good a bully. Like, frankly, if your bully, if your captor and bully 20 years later is like, I've still got one joke, you're not even good as a bully. I mean, it's a, it's a torture in and of itself. I guess. To only have one joke, to be like, you're going to hear one joke today for the rest of your life. It's going to be the same joke yeah. about your boyfriend. I'm going to bully you for the same thing. I you, mean, you haven't had a lot of life experience trapped in here. That's what I was going to say. For the, in the therapist's defense of her bullying, yeah. there's very little to work with. Because I think Shriek never even was in the real world. Like I think, I think Cletus breaks out and has a serial killing spree and right. then goes back to jail right. after the, the Ravencroft thing. But she's just always been in an institution, it seems. So you just got the one thing. Unless she's got like a family yeah she probably i mean everyone does <laughs> somehow yeah um so yeah there's very little to work with but like yeah this this lady is not nice enough or mean enough right i'm with you mm -hmm. for one way or the other but i also didn't care when she died because i'm like you're being kind of mean to a lady who seems like you've only tied up because she has magic powers yeah like, and like what did she do and are you trying to replicate it or are you just trying to like contain hide her from her? society to contain it like what is the goal here and I'm kind of okay we didn't explore it but you could have at least a one-off line 
to be like, Shriek, you're too dangerous to ever be let go in society. I hope you realize that. Like, you know, like have a, instead of a line to be like, your boyfriend was in the news. What is that? A newspaper that I snuck in to show you your boyfriend? Someone had a crush once. Ha 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 ha. I'm an adult psychiatrist. But you not sound an, really lonely, lady. Yeah, but not an evil one, not like I'm a not like, experiment. Yeah, just a like I don't I, have any goals. I'm, I'm just a bit of a dick. I'm just a someone. I'm just a dick who's around. Those lines could easily be we can't let you out because so they could have been just some exposition dump. Yeah. yeah. I mean, make her a little bit more evil, I think, because uh it always like makes the kill a little bit more like, yeah, she deserved that. Yeah, I feel you there. Once Cletus and Tree kill her. Yeah. Just be like, ah, good. Yeah. But yeah, I'm I'm with you. I do like all the villains tied together right off the top. It keeps it tight, it keeps it fast. Uh the the time gap is a bit much, but other than that, I'm I'm on board for like how tied together they are. Uh now talking about like Detective Mulligan. I, this this ending of like him and his eyes glow. I'm like, okay, I guess. Uh, I don't know what. Well, I googled him. Uh-huh. He is a symbiote in the comics. He's toxic. He's toxic. Okay, yes. you know. Yes. Well, then what? I I don't know how he got. Any yeah, powers, that's the problem. And I don't know if he's alive or dead. Yeah, like, that's the problem. Was, and and like also, you fought Shriek. You didn't even fight one of the symbiotes. Yeah. So how did you get any any symbiote in you? Yeah, yeah. What? What's any of that? That final fight scene is a mess. Like, this movie is a nonsense popcorn movie from the late 90s, early 2000s. It's kind of a throwback in genre style and attempt, and it's very aware of it. And I'd say for the most part, it is very, like, campy aspects of that area, that era of cinema that kind of work. But the one campy aspect that is a throwback that does not work, which is to get this movie down to 90 minutes, there are random chunks cut out of the final action set piece, Mm. which is something a lot of action movies used to do for some fucking reason, where they'd be like, let's cut time from the action scene so that sequentially nothing makes sense. The things we spent the most money on. Yeah, because so there are times in that whole third act, that third act final action set piece where it's like, Oh no, Shriek's unconscious. No, she's not. She's holding Detective Mulligan? Oh, they've both been thrown unconscious. No, Detective Mulligan has her now? Okay, he's dead. Like, th- yeah, it's just, okay, there's dead. no consistency. It's just jumping around with some random footage. Yeah, it is It is a little disconnected. Because I think at one point, like, Venom is standing next to her on the bell tower. And then, like, she yells, but it only hits Carnage. And I'm like, Venom was... Where's Venom? And he's like on the ground now. It was yeah. There was there was some disconnect in the in the final fight. Mm-hmm. Now here's a question about the about the movie that I think the final fight highlighted the most. At what point do you think they stopped going for an R rating? Ooh. Because there was a lot of moments where you're like, oh, you didn't plan on cutting away there. It's tough. It is tough. Because the first one's R, right? I actually don't know if the first one's... No, no, the first one's not R. Oh, okay. I think the first one, they did that thing where, like, the home release now is the, like, unrelated... Unrated. Unrelated. Unrated. Unrelated. Unrelated. Doesn't connect. Uh, The unrated home where they actually, like, have a bit more in. But the theatrical, I think, still was, like, a PG-13 or whatever. (laughs) Whatever it was, yeah. Because I think the most glaring, like part where you're like okay you, you wanted an R was when they cut away right before Carnage eats that priest's head mm, yeah. and you're like oh you definitely originally shot that priest getting his head eaten yeah and you chose not to show that and because and like no one else gets their head eaten except for Cletus and I think you're allowed to have one head eaten it's like your fuck yeah yeah <laughs> maybe you can have you one get, head eaten. you yeah. get one head eaten yeah. you get one fuck yeah those are the rules for PG-13 so the one scene that really tipped me off that I'm like, oh, you definitely changed this from an R down to something and you had to make some edits to do it. For me, it was when Carnage goes to break out Shriek. Okay. So Carnage, like Woody Harrelson's in the room with Shriek and you can see like the the psychologist out through the window is like being hung by her neck mm-hmm. and then her body falls, but there's no head attached to it. Implying uh, that, like, Carnage definitely ate that head. Mm-hmm. You see a quick body fall with no head, and it's moving fast, but, like, you're like, okay, Carnage off camera ate that head. 
then later when uh, like the police arrive to like look at the scene, they show all the bodies and the psychologist is there and like her head's back on now though. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. But also sure. there's a lot of blood in that scene and they go through it. They pan past these bodies very quickly and there is blood. There's some red stuff on the ground. And I think it was cheaper rather than try to use visual effects to remove the blood, they put in, there is a janky looking jar, uh, a can of red paint on its side. And no. it says red paint. There wasn't. So there is a can of red paint in the middle of all of these bodies. And it's like one second. And if they had have lingered on it, it would be funny like sincerely truly like red th paint yeah, this this movie is like winking and nudging at the camera they know their camp this is a joke and that's very funny but it was so fast that i'm like it's not meant to be funny it's but that's fucking hilarious it's just a continuity cover for the blood a red paint can is the funniest fucking thing to be there that is absolutely hilarious and yeah it's kind of ridiculous that they won't show they won't show anyone's head being eaten and it's a movie who doesn't have a lot of plot, but one of the plots is eating heads makes them stronger. Mm. Because the because Venom is constantly like, I need heads. Like chocolate yeah. and chickens are not doing it. Like I will only be strong if I eat heads. Right. And Carnage is this much stronger than me because he's been eating dudes. Like the, the camera cuts away, but we know he's been eating some heads. Right, he's a growing boy. To the point where I sincerely thought this is where the movie was going. 100% absolutely thought there's a point where Venom is like on the ground in the church and he's like, he's weak. And, and Dan, he, the, uh, yeah. And Dan comes over and he's like, you gotta save Anne. By the way, they're named Dan and Anne. Awful naming. Terrible. Writers, hello. Yeah. Um, so Dan comes over, he's like, Venom, you gotta get up. And he's like, he has his like, come on Spider-Man moment and he's like trying to find the motivation to do it. And I'm like, Oh my God, he's going to eat Dan's head. I thought also Dan that Dan, Dan was Dan, going to be like, eat my head and get stronger. I thought he was going to give himself a sacrifice to try to save Anne. Absolutely where I thought this movie was going. And I was like, they're not actually going to do a, a sacrifice play where you get eaten willingly by the hero. That's crazy. It would have been crazy. It would have been crazy. And I have no doubt there's a draft where that happened. I think so. Because there's no explanation of how he just got stronger then. He just willpower. He was just like, no, wait, I can. Yeah. Never mind. I wasn't trying. Now that enough. I think about it. <laughs> now that I think about it, I am stronger than Carnage, yeah. I guess. Yeah. But yeah, definitely thought Dan's head was going to get eaten, which was going to be wild because I'm like, he's been like a really good character this movie. He saved your butt a bunch of times. That fire from the balcony thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was, it was, I, I like that Venom came around to liking Dan at the end of the movie. I like that too. And as much as this movie is a campy throwback to action movies a decade ago, or several decades ago, I, I like that they kept some more modern and progressive stuff. Whereas, like, action movies of the 90s and early 2000s are very much a, like, once you're in love, you're in love for life. You will never love anyone else again. The new boyfriend is an asshole to always be hated, no matter who they are. Uh, whereas, like, modern kind of action superhero movies, like, you know, you're, like, Ant-Man kind of has that idea yeah. of, like, a modern family to be, like, it's okay to, like, break up be friends with exes, have a divorce, still be civil, like have a kid together, like your ex's new boyfriend. Like I enjoy that they, even though this is a throwback to a type of writing that doesn't exist anymore, that they kept a newer aspect of, uh, of like it, getting to like Dan and at not trying to break them up by the end of the movie. No, absolutely. I think that's a, a great uh, analysis of how Venom is a progressive superhero and maybe also might be why Michelle Williams pops a little more than most characters like this in a 90s movie. Like, mm. she actually, like, isn't just like, oh, no, love triangle. She's like, this is not a love triangle. I'm in with Dan and I'm just trying to keep you alive. <laughs> like, yeah. It's not, yeah. It's not love. It's just like, we're still friends. And she does have like the one line as she's getting into the car about like kissing Eddie as Venom when she was Venom to be like, I don't know, it's weird. It's interesting. This weird, like, I don't know, man, I am in a monogamous relationship, but that was some, 
that was some sexually fluid shit that I don't quite know how to process. But also, like, Venom, I was down for it, kind of. But Venom, like, also kind of precipitated it. Like, it's he complicated. Clearly, he was in charge at the time, so he clearly wanted the kiss to happen. It wasn't yeah. fueled by Anne. Because yeah. when Venom's got the full body going, that's his choices. That's his choices, then. Yeah. Those are his choices that he's making. Speaking of his choices... You know what? I have a lot more positives in this movie than I so, thought. The, do you want to talk about the, uh, the like the I'm I'm uh, I'm out I'm section? Out. Yeah, the, the the masquerade. I don't know if it was Pride or just a rave. It's hard to tell with or glow sticks. Or if it was Halloween or it what? was a masquerade. It was it wasn't a masquerade. Halloween, okay, but like glow sticks make it so hard because I'm like a rave just has glow sticks, but a Pride event also would have rainbow glow sticks. So right, I'm like, right. I'm not sure which this is, and I think they might have purposely left it kind of. Right, that they're just like, this is a Whatever heavily LGBTQ be. plus event that people happen to have costumes at. Whatever you think that is, that's what this is, maybe. Yeah, but it was very fun. It was really fun. It was really fun. It is, uh, so, like, I have I have a lot. I, okay, so oh, shit. with this, I really like it. I think it's a lot of fun. I don't know whether or not there are aspects of it that I shouldn't like because... I like in the first movie, like, this became this, like, gay romance and, like, Venom unexpectedly, much like the Babadook, became this LGBTQ icon that I think is fun and cool and I love the energy of. uh, And I think that that's fantastic. I like that they kind of lean into that in this one. I think they could have leaned into it a little more. Like, they still do that, like everything he's saying has double meaning and coded language Mm -hmm. because even when it's an alien symbiote, they aren't willing to have an openly gay character in anything ever. I mean, it it doesn't even really have a gender. I know. But, and that also makes it even more cowardly that the (laughs) film just can't have Venom be like, I'm gay for Eddie. Like just (laughs) have him. They definitely don't say I'm gay for Eddie. He's male coded for sure. Uh, I don't know. I mean, when he, when he goes in a lady, he becomes a lady. He has a deep male voice. He has, he does have a deep, yeah. So I, there's, there are mixed things. He's gender fluid, perhaps we'll say. Uh, but yeah, I still, I still think that I'm like the film didn't want to fully lean in to be like this is a romantic relationship, and they danced around it. I'm like just fucking dive in, all right? They are, you know, you do break up. Like yeah. there's definitely a breakup that happens, and whether that's that usually is romantic. You live in each other's bodies. You know each other's thoughts. Like there is. There's weird, not weird levels, but there's like unusual levels that you don't see, but also like just acknowledge that it's like could be like a regular level that it's love. Yeah. Or a relationship of some kind. So that's that's my only negative. I would have liked more acknowledgement. Mm-hmm. It felt uh, a very it felt very silly. It felt very Sony. It felt uh, like it wanted to be an R-rated movie, but it still felt a touch Disney to be like, we can never actually use the word gay out loud. We can have him say, I'm coming out, and it implies that he's coming out of a particular room, and maybe people will code and imply that it means the other meaning of it. Venom is so, Disney's 15th first gay character. Ex- <laughs> exactly, exactly. Ex- that's exactly what I'm I'm getting at for the things that I don't like. But I love, but I do still love that uh, the, the writers of this movie knew that that was a thing that was appreciated about Venom, understood the coding of the character for that, and had fun with it and welcomed it and invited it. And I think it was like a powerful, fun, uh, energetic sequence. I liked it. It's a fun, energetic sequence. I will have a complaint about Venom's, not so much that scene, but Venom's whole like off on his own part is the things he did on his own were all things Eddie would let him do. So mm. like he breaks up with Eddie. He's like, well, I'm going to go to a party. And I'm like, Eddie would let you go to a party. I'm going to run across the rooftops. I'm like, I saw you run across the rooftops with Eddie. Like, are you eating people? That's the only thing he won't let you do. Yeah. And he still doesn't eat people even after he breaks up with Eddie. So like, I'm kind of like, why are you even fighting? Right. What are you even doing that Eddie won't let you do? And also, maybe I'm petty. I think Venom needed to apologize to Eddie. <laughs> Mm. Venom demanded an apology. Venom broke his TV and his motorcycle. All Eddie did was say mean things. That is true. <laughs> they both deserved an apology. Yeah. I, I hope after this whole thing was over. That Venom issued an apology to Eddie. I do. I can see that. I think both parties deserve apologies. I can see and I can agree with that. In a big fight. Hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the the but the actual rape scene is very, very fun. I do it is really nice just seeing someone being welcomed into a community. Oh yeah, like, like a it's beautifully genuinely positive sequence. Yeah, it 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 yeah, it raised my spirits. <laughs> it made me feel 
happy and like it was uh it was a joyous section of the film for me i really liked it i had a great time more more of that more of that uh if they are going to do more of that i would say one one negative about that sequence or at least about like how it looked is that the the cgi of venom i think it's actually relatively well done Oh yeah, um, Venom looks great. Venom, I, think, I think Carnage looked better, actually. But uh, yeah, I think Carnage looked a bit better. I think they've done a good job of the CGI in this movie. But I think Venom, the way that they have him designed, works as the I'm in a fight killing monster. He works as I'm ooze coming out of Eddie Brock's back shoulder as I'm making eggs and I'm a face that you talk to in the air. As a character walking around with its own thoughts and feelings and going through something, it didn't have enough emotion in its face. Like, it mm. didn't, it was missing something in how it looked and moved in that sequence. It's, it felt still like fight scene mode Venom, and that just happened to be in a very positive nightclub environment giving a speech. And it didn't feel like a Venom that, like, had more facial range or expression or was feeling something or going through something in the way that it feels like when it's in Eddie's head or it's kind of, like, gooing out of his shoulder or whatever. That's fair. I think a lot of it was vocal performance uh, during the the masquerade scene. So it's a lot of Tom Hardy's, like, actual performance doing it. You're right about the face. Because I think he was actually more expressive when he was in Mrs. Chen. Because they were yeah. doing this weird like half face, like I agree. it was still her body, but his face was overlaid, and they like gave him like eyebrows, and he would like grumble and sulk, and you could you got a lot more venom in the Mrs. Chen scene than at the Pride scene. Mm. So yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. He's definitely a, like a nice hulking presence. Um, I think the final thing we do have to have a final thing of the end credit scene. Yes, so I of think the, the last thing that we we should talk about for the movie is the end credit scene, which is. It coming into the MCU, which is fucking huge and expected. It's but huge and not surprising, but also like... Hugely surprising. It's hugely surprising they confirm it in this movie instead of him just showing up in a later movie. Right, Although right. what's wild is, guys, maybe you've all forgotten this. The vultures at the end of the Morbius trailer, just FYI. So they've like, already confirmed with the like, Morbius the Morbius trailer Morbius. confirms the Sony MCU multiverse. The movie no one is excited for for confirmed yeah. all of this before the No Way Home trailer, before this movie, so that's yeah, wild. Yeah. But yeah, him actually like getting the J. Jonah clip and seeing Spider-Man, like seeing Spider-Man with an actual venom is going to be awesome yeah like tom hardy's gross trashy venom with our pure bean tom holland i love it i love it and i'm so excited for it i think it's i I, like that is that is a huge end credit and it made me so amped i like how they executed it too i i like this like they're on vacation together first of all the beach ending was lovely they're on vacation together because they're a romantic couple. Uh, once again, Disney's 16th first gay character. But they're a romantic couple. They're on a vacation together. And this opening up speech. Now, I, I do feel like that the some of the dialogue throws it off a bit because they're having this conversation. And the Venom symbiote is saying to Eddie, like, I've seen universes and worlds that you can't believe. Let me show you. Mm -hmm. As if we're now about to get, like, flashes of a multiverse as seen by and experienced by this symbiote or something. Mm -hmm. But then we hear the symbiote Venom, the the symbiote Venom be like, what is happening? Oh, like, so this is a multiverse that's happening And this multiversal moment and merging has nothing to do with the fact that Venom was about to open up, which makes it kind of a weird line of dialogue to happen before. But I do like that they're having this nice moment. I like the setting. I like the hotel room switching from night to day and being a slightly nicer hotel room. Teleporting trash Eddie into like literally going from like we are going from night to day. We are now going to positive sunny Spider Manville, mm-hmm. where like we have this resort has changed. We've changed literally the world around yeah, you. Yeah, the, the bedding is more flowerful. The sun is brighter here. There's a towel swan now. It's so much nicer than it was before. I like that as a transition. That works really well. I like that a lot too. But the thing about opening up is a weird entry point that mm. Venom was like, that's not what it is, unless like. 
the fact that he was opening his mind as the multiverse hit is like the only reason he was the only one who transported. Mm. Like if no one from his world is there, like Anne's not there, Carnage isn't there, Dr. Dan isn't there, like Venom might be the only reason he transported because he was opening his mind at the moment. Right. Maybe, Maybe. But like, but yeah, either way, like as much as like, I actually like just think the Venom movies are fine and not especially for me, but I am super excited for this Venom to meet Spider-Man. Well, because one of the (laughs) greatest things about this Venom is just Tom Hardy having the time of his goddamn life. And if you let him do that with, like, other people who are having the time of their life, of course it's going to be a blast. Of course. Yeah, this Venom has fun on his own. Throw this Venom in with other superheroes? Oh, boy. Yeah. That's a party. Yeah. Put him on the fucking Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't give a shit. He's from space. Why did he lick Peter's face on the TV? I feel like he had some kind of like knowledge, because he doesn't have a spider on his chest. Do, no, he doesn't. Oh, does this Venom not? No, this Venom doesn't. Oh, okay. No, there's like he has he like doesn't. veininess that could be interpreted. Mm. That was the other thing I was actually expecting is that Eddie sees Spider-Man on the TV. Things have clearly changed. I was expecting when he goes full Venom in that scene because he turns full Venom for a second in the hotel. I thought that was going to be, and it was the perfect moment for a redesign of the look to see him transform. And now he's kind of like the Venom before, but he's got the very visible white Spider-Man logo on his Uh, chest, like in the comics. And now the MCU animators make him instead of the Sony animators. That would have been a perfect time for a character redesign and have Eddie look in a mirror and be like, what, what is this? Uh, and then, like, look at the TV and see that his spider symbol matches that spider symbol, and things are different here. Uh, but you know, they, they kept the symbol, the, they they kept the look the same, and that's that's fine. They still have time to redesign it or do something different if they want to. Do you think he's in No Way Home, or do you think he's in later stuff? I think he's in No Way Home. What a what a movie! I think No Way Home is going. All fucking out. Full Spider-Verse. Yeah. Like, even more so than Spider-Verse. Spider-Verse don't have a Venom. Yeah, because before we knew fully how how hard in No Way Home was going, because the, ne- the one after that is Doctor Strange, Multiverse yeah. of Madness, right? And I'm now starting to think that Multiverse of Madness, obviously they're going to have, like, a scene or two tying in some of the events of Spider-Man. But I don't think it's gonna become. It's gonna be like a a two parter of the Spider Man story. So I think they're cramming as much of this shit as possible into No Way Home. Yeah, I think all the Spider Man stuff is gonna be in Spider Man. Like I don't think Venom is a Doctor Strange like villain. Like mm. it's gonna be all like here's all the Spider stuff. Yeah. yeah. Enjoy. Yeah, unless they're building up to a Sinister Six. I don't know. Ooh, for like a Spider-Man four. Yeah, mm. because like if Spider-Man, th- if Spider-Man No Way Home is gonna be the like the Spider Verse, we're doing everything. Then is the next one be like that's when we get have like Morbius, Vulture, mm. Mysterio comes back. We have Venom. We do a whole fucking thing. Maybe, maybe. that would explain Vulture and Morbius. Yeah, mm, interesting. Yeah, interesting. I, like I don't it. know. I don't know. It's we'll it's huge. To, it's huge. It was. It is huge. It was cool. It was cool. Yeah. It was, it was pretty cool. For a movie I was only like, I liked, I was like, this is cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I can't wait to see the two of them on screen together. The two I'm Toms? so happy for Tom Hardy. Tom and Tom. Oh, the two be, Toms. Oh, my two Toms. I. Having fun. I adore it. I, I, God, I'm very excited to see these two together. It's going to be great. Uh, all right. You feeling good? I'm feeling good. You really talked me into liking this movie more than I did. Wasn't trying to. I know you weren't, but your enthusiasm was very infectious. Uh, I appreciate I'm that. I'm infected. Uh, that's what I go for. All right, well, let's go in for the close. Let's ask the final question of what would you change? Uh, so now that we've discussed everything we discussed, what would you change if you could change anything about this movie? But before we do ask the final question, we want to thank our third and final sponsor of today's episode. They are back. It is our wonderful friends over at Virtual Game Night. Guys, you know we love Virtual Game Night. and It's your last chance to play. Virtual Game Night is taking bookings through December 23rd, 2021 only. This is That's your it. last chance to book your virtual game night. We talked about virtual game night last year on the podcast. We're talking about them now. If you didn't do it last year, you've got to get on it this year. It, it is the last chance. What virtual game night is, uh, if you're unfamiliar, if you don't remember us talking about it last year, it is a uh, a fantastic, basically like a pub trivia night slash like you're on a game show. So it's a, a, a all virtual, just over Zoom 
digital trivia night that is going to be one of the best nights you could possibly have with your friends, your coworkers, your family, whatever event that you have going on. It's it's a really good time. And this is not like an automated thing. There is a host who's who's doing all the emceeing for you, being charming, keeping everything going. Your scores will be on screen. It's all digital. You don't need pen and paper, but it's also super straightforward and easy. Super fast and smooth. Like, yeah, you just open up a, a page on your phone to answer the questions on your phone or another tab or whatever you have going on to answer the questions. It's all in real time. It's so smooth. It's so smooth. Games can be 30, 60, or 90 minutes, whatever you need. There's tons of games. They're all so fun. We've played like six, eight games now. We've played quite a few. Yeah. There's, a, there's a huge variety of games. And you can also make like custom requests as well. So if you're like, me and my friends are just geography idiots. Mm -hmm. There won't be any geography question. Don't worry, like it, it can all be customized to what it is that you like. Uh, and with it, with the games that, that are currently there, it's well rounded as well. Like when we played with our friends, us and our friends, we all have like different interests, different knowledge and skill set. Uh, but we all kind of excelled at a different game. Like some of it was like emoji games to try to decipher what the emojis meant. And we found out a couple of our friends are just idiots who do, do not understand that. Some of them were like memory games. You watch a music video and you got to like check. All oh, the music you gotta, video one was, was fun. That was fun. You got yeah. to dance to a music video while you're also like, remember all the stuff. Yeah. A sequencing game called Missing Links where it's like this, this, then, and you've got to figure out what like the next, the mm -hmm. link is going to be. And Ollie is a wonderful host who's so charming mm -hmm. and so fun. And he takes takes all the planning away. If you're doing a virtual holiday party or a virtual get together for the holidays, he, all the work's off your plate. It's yeah. gonna all be done for you. And Virtual Game Night has hosted games for, for some of the world's best known companies, uh, Adobe, Ford, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, as well as uh, students and alumni of uh, educational institutions like MIT, Yale, Harvard. And you hear that and you might think to yourself, Oh, we don't have a get together that big. The Virtual Game Night's also done one for the From Superheroes Network Christmas Party, which is eight idiots who love TV and film. So big or small, a virtual game night's for you. Yeah, you can run MIT or Google, or it could be a family gathering over the holidays. It's going to be perfect for you. So turn uh, a virtual gathering into a virtual game night today by visiting virtualgamenight.live/superhero100 and use promo promo code superhero100 to take 100 US dollars off the price of any game. So remember the games must end December 23rd, 2021. So join over 17,000 other players who have livened up their Zoom calls by making your next and hopefully last virtual event a virtual game night at virtual game night dot live slash superhero 100 and don't forget to enter code superhero 100 to receive a $100 credit towards the price of any game night package. Uh, and thank you, Virtual Game Night, for your support and your wonderful nights. Thank you for everything you've done for us, Virtual Game Night, and everything you will do for everyone who signs up. Oh, it's beautiful. And as well, uh, before we get into our final question, we'll remind you, as we do every week, if you haven't already, please take a second to uh, rate, review, and subscribe on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, wh wherever you get your stuff. Uh, subscribe, follow, whatever the verbiage they use is, and then uh, leave a little rating and review. It helps us move up the charts. It helps these apps recommend us to new people. Uh, and as well, when uh, new people discover the podcast, they do check those reviews. So positive reviews, uh, it makes it more likely that new listeners are actually going to hit download and give us a chance. People are checking up on us, guys. Mm -hmm. They're like, who are these people? And you got to let them know in your reviews. And we really appreciate it. We have some lovely ones on there. We'd love a few more so the apps know that we're nice. Absolutely. So let do them, that. Let them know we're nice. Free way to support the podcast. I know uh, every podcast tells you to do this. So while you're there, carve out five minutes of your day. Do it for a few of the podcasts that you love, not just us, uh, because it does make a world of difference to podcasters ourselves included, but others like us as well. Uh, and if you want to support the show monetarily and get cool bonuses for it, you can check us out over on Patreon, which is a monthly subscription service where you can subscribe at whatever is in your budget. You can do as little as a buck a month, uh, as much as you can afford. At the $10 hero level, you get a bonus episode of this podcast every single month that is exclusive to our Patreon page. Yeah, you get all access to all the old ones also when you sign up at mm -hmm. $10 a month. So there is 
so much talk from superheroes waiting for you over at patreon.com uh in september we did quantum of solace so if you want the whole james bond package of movies of the daniel mm-hmm. craig series before uh no time to die next no time week to die next week then you gotta you gotta check us over on patreon there's also smaller amounts for a dollar you get to text with superheroes a day early we do a bunch of stuff no matter what you get something and uh there's no like contracts or obligations you can cancel or change your subscription level at any given time uh and even if you don't care about any of the bonuses if you just want to support the network uh, for a buck a month or whatever is in your budget. It makes a huge difference. It's how we pay for all of the equipment, all of our web hosting, all of the overhead that we have here at the network. Uh, and it also keeps us fed and taken care of, and we appreciate you greatly. I love having food. Love having food. So good. Patreon.com slash from superheroes. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash from superheroes, if it's in the budget. And thank you to all of our current patrons and all of our future patrons as well. Thank you so much, patrons. And now let's go in for the close. Let's ask the final question of what would you change? Diana, what would you change? It's fucking venom. Uh, <laughs> it's like impenetrable to change. Like the, the tone's going to be the same no matter what you do. But if I had to have a change, uh, my change is actually like a little bit of a swing, but I'm going to go for it. Um, my change is I actually would like to see more with Detective Mulligan, oddly enough, in the finale. Um, I really liked this idea that like Shriek is loud, the symbiotes can't do noise, and that he's been deafened. But he hasn't really been fully deafened because like one ear is still seems to have hearing and then one ear has a hearing aid. I would like if he was fully deafened in the opening. And then he has to use some kind of sonic device against the symbiotes. And he's the only one who can because he's already deaf. Mm. And any other human who tried, if Anne or Dan, Anne and Dan, Jesus. <laughs> it does seem like you're getting it wrong when you say it, but you're you're right. Those you're getting are the it right. Those character names: yeah. Michelle Williams and Dan. Uh, like if they tried, like the the like maybe it's like a sonic device that has too much feedback and it will like blow your eardrums. But if yeah. he's already deaf, he can just like destroy Carnage. And I kind of like that because like as a detective, he's been trying to stop Cletus and find like get, find these bodies and like get closure for the families so as much as i think venom should like eat cletus at the end i would like detective mulligan to be part of the win i think he deserves it he seems like a good cop who's like genuinely trying so and i would like his disability to play into like a win of like an advantage in the fight so i think that would be kind of cool that would be my big change they have some kind of sonic weapon or the bell gets to be rung a few more times or something that's uh that's my that's my change the rest is just venom it's i can't i can't change venom He's got a he's got a thing to him. So the rest of the movie is like, yeah, that's all the same. All right, that's my change. What yeah, I, what would you change? I, I I love your change. I agree with this. Uh, yeah, Detective Mulligan being more involved in the end. If he's gonna be there, why not have him more involved? Why don't, not do something a little bit extra with him? Weirdly, make his eyes glow or explain why they're glowing. You gotta at maybe least because he used it. a sonic device. I don't know. Maybe yeah, because like Carnage got his through biting Eddie. How how did Mulligan get anything? <laughs> So, I, yeah, I, that's a whole other thing. But I agree with you that uh, Mulligan using a sonic weapon, I think, is a, a great way to tie it all in together. Thank you. Uh, I, I think that, um, that we don't need Shriek at a different facility. Mm-hmm. It does nothing. This whole subplot of, like, but we were separated, and I put a secret message in the newspaper of where she should meet me. But she doesn't. Like, she she he just stays know, in her room. Until yeah. he comes and gets her. So why they can't just be in the same prison the whole time and escape together. Like, I don't think we need to have this, like... You can't cut ten more minutes out of this movie, babe. It's only going to be an hour and twenty. <laughs> That's all we need. That's all we need. <laughs> so short. That's all we need. Put back in whatever you, they took out of that third act okay, action that, scene, that you know? Works. That works, that works. But I, the, it just, it doesn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. This whole, like, I need to sneak you messages because I know that you're alive out there somewhere. And she is, but the messages aren't needed because he has magic hacking abilities randomly due to being Carnage. Remember that? When oh, he yeah, go, yeah. He just, he like, goes to a gas her station. name into, a, into any computer on the internet. He turns into a Terminator and finds her through internets. Which doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's a completely needless plot line, and it also just makes it awkward because that draws attention to this 20-year time span where a random psychiatrist is just mocking this lady over a boyfriend she had once. Well, what would the psychiatrist do, though, if they were in the same facility? (laughs) Nothing. Like, we could just be like, here was an escape attempt. Yeah, but here's an escape attempt 20 years ago where a guard got deafened. Mm. Now, today... 
they are in the same prison and one of them's on death row. They escape together. I like this. How would you feel about we like, they've just kind of always been in the same prison and we can shorten up that time span too. Love that. Because the time span is so long to be in love. Yeah. For like 24 years? Yeah. 1996? Yeah. Like that's too long. For like a manic psychotic Mm -hmm. To be like, I've really held on to love for this long. Yeah, they would have to see each other more frequently or more recently. Yeah, I think that I think that works out really well. Like just like adjoining men in women's prisons or something, or they put him Mm. in like the mutant prison because he's so much of a jerk. Yeah, (laughs) he's such a killer. Absolutely. No, I I think that's a special like super max that's only for like powered people or the craziest of crazy, and they both happen to be there. Yeah. I think that makes sense. That's kind of even what Arkham is in like the Batman comics. It yeah. holds it holds people with powers and people who are just regular. That's idiots. where Joker and Harley become a thing, and like that worked. So just just do that. They see each other all the time. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Actually, that's a great change. Yeah, love it. Uh, Fine. yeah, I'm, I'm and I'm on board with yours. I think both of them uh, make it better. Excellent. Hmm. Venom two. Venom. Venomer. Venom two. Venomer. So excited to see what Venom three will be. It's, or Spider-Man No Way Home. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we get both. Hopefully we get Spider-Man No Way Home and we get to see what Tom Hardy's Venom will be like in the Tom Holland Spider-Man universe. Oh, my God. And then he gets to go back to being camp and crazy. Like, I, I don't want to give this up as a sacrifice to the MCU, but I do want him to dabble over there and then pop back to this type of movie. Well, I hope you get what you want because I know you love Venom and I, like I want all the dream. best for you and your Venom loves. We can dream. Uh, all right, and uh, that is it for our discussion on uh, Venom, Let There Be Carnage. We will be back next week, and next week we're going to be talking about James Bond again with No Time to Die. It's coming out It for is. Real it is coming out. It is the length of two Venom 2s. Jesus, it I is. I believe. Uh, so it's going to be oh a, my God. a long one. How would you not let us stream this, James? Oh, let's strap it. James, you, you did it to us. Uh, we'll be back next week to talk about that. In the meantime, if you want to get a hold of us, you can reach me on Twitter at Ivamy, I-V-I-M-E-Y. You can reach me at Words of Diana. And you can reach both of us at From Superheroes. And we'll see you all next week. Check out my pinned tweet. 